You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. Hi, I'm Mordechai Becher, and this is uh, Shalom TV, Dimensions of the Duff, in which we explore different ideas in the Talmud, sections of the Talmud, concepts from the Talmud, uh, everything Talmud. And uh, every show is uh, basically a quantum unit, independent, stands by itself. Uh, you don't have to have continuity, you don't have to have seen previous shows and to understand this, and you don't have to have any knowledge of Talmud in order to understand this either. I translate everything and I explain everything. And uh, I want to thank everyone for feedback. Uh, we've got emails and uh, also when I go around lecturing uh, various places, I always get people uh, telling me that they've seen me on Shalom TV. And I get a big kick out of that and they get a big kick out of uh, me coming uh, live and speaking there, etc. That way they can actually ask questions and, and heckle, etc., which you cannot do in your situation. Um, anyway, so uh, what I want to do today Apropos of Hanukkah coming up, which I think this is shown around Hanukkah time, you'll probably be seeing this. Uh, I'm pre-recording, obviously. Uh, but anyway, um, Hanukkah. Now Hanukkah, uh, just a background, a little background historically, is that um, this occurred uh, during a break in Jewish statehood. So you had these two periods when there was from Joshua until the destruction of the first temple, which is approximately 800 years. Uh, Jews have been living in Israel with our own kings, with Jerusalem as the capital, with the temple in Jerusalem, etc., etc. And um, we exiled the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar, uh, invades Israel, destroys the temple, exiles the Jews to Babylon, modern-day Iraq. Now, uh, Babylonian Empire was eventually taken over by the, there were the Medeans and there were the Persians, but basically it trans, in the immortal uh, expressions that Calvin uses, it transmogrified and it became the Persian Empire. Now the Persian Empire had various emperors and kings and one of them, known as, uh, in Hebrew at least, as Ahasuerosh, uh, was, in the, uh, was in that period and that's when we had Purim happen. Now, that's 70 years, 70 years. Now, after, that, after Purim, the Jews were able to come back to Israel under the reign of King Darius. We came back to Israel, rebuilt the temple. And that lasted for about 200 years, so second temple, which goes back approximately 2,200. So beginning of the second temple era is about 2,400, 2,500 years ago. Okay, about 500 BCE. Now, 200 years into that, of course, you had the reign of a very famous... Uh, about 100 years into that or so, there was a very famous Alexander the Great. He was a powerful and uh, brilliant uh, man, and he had a unified empire. When he died, his empire broke up. So the land of Israel was actually the sandwich between, or I should say Suvlakid, between two remnants of the Greek empire of Alexander. Number one was the north east of Israel, which was Syria, the Seleucid Empire, which was a Hellenistic empire, and to the southwest of Israel, Egypt, the Ptolemaic Empire. And in between the two, right, the filling of the gyro was basically uh, the, the, the Jews. Now, for various reasons, the Jews, we got on reasonably well with the Egyptian Greeks, the Ptolemaic Empire, re pretty reasonably well. Um, unfortunately, the uh, Antiochus, the head of the Syrian Greeks, uh, was, not, um, was not interested in, uh, in living together with us. He wanted to take over. And he didn't only want to take over, he wanted to, us to become Greeks. He wanted the Jews to become Greeks. He wanted to replace Falafel with Suvlaki and the Hora with the Zorba 
and uh, he wanted us to watch old Telly Savalas movies and so on and so forth. Horrific stuff. Anyway, but seriously, he wanted to actually assimilate the Jewish people and turn us into a vassals of the Greek Empire, both uh, militarily and politically, and also religiously and culturally. And uh, the Greeks were quite successful, I should point out, from their perspective. Josephus Flavius, the great Jewish Roman historian, points out that, that during this time there are entire cities in Israel which were populated by almost 100% Jews that you would not know there were any Jews there. Everyone had Greek hairstyles. Everyone dressed in the Greek fashion. There was not a mezuzah on the door. There were no synagogue. There were Greek temples. There were naked athletes, etc., etc. Everything was, it was Greek. And uh, the descendants of those Jews assimilated and became Greek, basically. So, um, you know, there's probably some shepherd, you know, Greek, one, some island in Greece, who's sitting there sipping his ouzo, right, craving some gefilte fish. So the reason is because he was originally Jewish at some point back. Anyway, so um, the, uh, this period, about 200 years, right after, in the middle of the Second Temple era, the Jews uh, were invaded by the Greeks, and as I said, massive assimilation. There are a number of incidents of, in which the Greeks, very, very, um, ar in a very arrogant and vicious fashion, um, you know, really, uh, really stamped down on Judaism in the land of Israel. And so there was a, there was a uh, family called the Maccabees who were, who were descendants of a very famous high priest called Shimon Hatzadik, Simon the Just. And the Maccabees uh, basically organized a guerrilla army. They organized an army to fight the Greeks. Now, you'd think of this as insane and suicidal. I mean, the Greek had a, Greeks had a huge army, well-garrisoned, well-trained, and the priests were the only members of the Jewish people who basically didn't fight in the army. They were not trained in warfare. They were priests. But they, they in desperation, because their spiritual survival was at stake, they fought the Greeks, and miraculously, they were successful against the Greeks. So that was the, uh, the Hanukkah, uh, the Maccabean revolt against the Greeks, uh, and they reestablished a monarchy in the, amongst the Jewish people that lasted for about another 200 years until the Romans um, came, uh, invaded Israel, destroyed the temple, and exiled the Jews. So a very successful revolt was the, the Hanukkah revolt. We, as I'm sure you're all aware, commemorate that in the winter, uh, usually either in uh, late November or sometime in December, and uh, it is uh, eight days. We commemorate for eight days, and the way we fulfill the we the way we celebrate Hanukkah is uh, a we light Hanukkah candles every night, one candle the first night, and we come up to uh, to to eight candles on the last night, and uh, many people do it with oil, uh, which is ideal uh, with olive oil uh, as it was at the time of the temple, olive oil and wicks. You can do it with candles as well; that's perfectly acceptable. Um, and so we light the candles. The second thing we do to celebrate is we say special prayers every day during Hanukkah. We say special prayers during morning service called Hallel, which is sections of Psalms, that, which is very, very happy and singing and clapping and foot stomping. And most synagogues don't do much foot stomping, uh, maybe in the south. But anyway, uh, we, um, we celebrate with those special prayers and we also add into our silent prayer every time we pray and also into our, into our grace after meals every time we we say a blessing after eating, we add into it a special blessing uh, for Hanukkah, a special section about Hanukkah. So we celebrate it in those ways. As you probably know, uh, it's also customary to eat, uh, eat foods cooked in oil. So we have latkes, which are potato pancakes fried in oil. And in Israel, people have sufganiyot, which are deep fried donuts, right? Uh, which are you know, done in oil. And um, so there are all types of customs that it's also... Um, you know, people have different customs on Hanukkah, but that's basically, that's basically the gist of it. I should point out that, that every festival in the Jewish calendar, all the festivals of the Jewish calendar, they have a tractate, you know, Passover, there's a whole tractate dealing with Passover, and Shabbat, there's a whole tractate, Purim, which is a rabbinic festival that took place during those 70 years in the Babylonian exile, that's a rabbinic, but there's a tractate about it, discussing it. The, the one festival that doesn't really appear anywhere in the Mishnah is Hanukkah. Hanukkah appears nowhere in the Mishnah. There is, there, there, it's, the name is mentioned, I think twice in the entire Mishnah, but nowhere in the Mishnah do you have the laws of Hanukkah. Nowhere in the Mishnah is there a full description of Hanukkah. 
it is as if it is absent from the Mishnah. Very strange, very strange idea. There are two major explanations for the absence. One's historical, one's a little more on the mystical side. The historical explanation, given by Reb Reuven Margolius, a brilliant scholar, a uh, Holocaust survivor who lived in Israel uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, so Reb Reuven, he wrote over 45 books. He was a very prolific author and brilliant scholar. So he's, he maintains, and he has evidence for this, that you see, the Mishnah was written in 170 to 200 of the Common Era, which means it was written in Israel when Israel was under the control of the Romans, the Roman Empire. So he said, since the Mishnah was written in Israel under the control of the Roman Empire, then the rabbis had to be a little careful about the type of stuff they were going to put in the Mishnah. So you see, since Hanukkah, what does Hanukkah celebrate? The successful revolt of the Jews against the Greek Empire occupying Israel. So can you imagine writing a tractate about the successful revolt against the occupying powers in Israel at the time that you were occupied by the Romans. Not politically correct, not smart, and at the time of the Romans, it did not just mean that the government would criticize you and, you know, in the press conference, they'd say, um, we uh, do not approve of, you know, that type of thing. No, right, if the Romans disapproved of something, you are dead. Right, so therefore, the rabbis had to be very careful about what they'd actually put in the Mishnah. And so therefore, especially Hanukkah, which the entire Hanukkah celebration is all about the Jews revolting against the occupiers of the land of Israel, i.e. the Greeks, and the Romans were the inheritors, so to speak, of the Greeks. So now, right, to write down the Mishnah would really be getting in the face of the Roman occupiers, and we would felt that it was, not, it was prudent not to do that. And he says, for the same reason, it's interesting to note that almost very, very minimum mention of the laws of conversion in the Mishnah as well, of a non-Jew converted, because we also know that the Romans were very much against people converting to Judaism, especially when the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire and became Christian, they made explicit laws against non-Jews converting to Judaism. And so consequently, writing about that would also not have been a politically good idea. And so therefore, the first answer as to why it's absent from the Mishnah is Rabbi Margolius, a historical answer, PC, political correctness. The answer given by Rav Yitzhak Hutner as to why it's not mentioned in the Mishnah is a slightly more mystical answer. And he says because since one of the things the Greeks wanted to do was to cause the Jews to assimilate, to blur the boundaries between the Jews and the, and the Greeks and the non-Jews. So therefore, they, uh, he, said, he said one of the main areas in which we had this distinction between the Jews and the non-Jews was the fact that we had the oral law, meaning we had uh, various traditions that were transmitted not by writing but orally, which means the only way you could be a member, you could, you could actually participate in that tradition process was if you were part of the club. If you were not part of the club, you couldn't have access to it. So therefore, the fact that it was even written down in the Mishnah is a compromise on that. Because once something is written down, it becomes much more publicly accessible. And so therefore, since the rabbis reluctantly wrote down the oral tradition, because they didn't want it to be lost, but they were reluctant about it. So the one festival which celebrates our victory over assimilation, which is a festival of the boundaries that it goes against the blurring of the boundaries, that's the one festival they did not want to commit to writing. They wanted to maintain that as an oral tradition, as something which was only available to members of the club, because that's what Hanukkah is about, retaining the club and retaining those boundaries. And that's really what it was about, so therefore they left it out of the Mishnah. Okay, having said that, introduction, now let's look at the Talmud. The Talmud asks an interesting question. In the English translation here, this is the Sonsino translation, right? but they don't translate it quite in a literal fashion. They say, what's the reason for Hanukkah? But actually, if you look in the Hebrew, the Talmud says, my Hanukkah, what's Hanukkah? And that's a strange question, right? What's Hanukkah? So Rashi's understanding, Rashi, the great commentary, 11th century France, he says, the meaning of that question is, al ezonais kavua, what miracle? is it that we are celebrating? You see, there were two miracles on Hanukkah. One miracle, which I described, was the miracle of the war. The fact that a small group of untrained priests is able to overcome the massive, powerful, and entrenched Greek army, that's miraculous. That's one miracle. There was a second miracle, 
which is the one which is more well known. But the second miracle is the miracle of the oil. We will discuss that. So the, uh, the, the, when they lit the candles in the menorah, okay, we'll discuss it. But, but Rashi is asking, what's the actual miracle? You see, because in general, we don't really have any festivals that celebrate military victory. We have festivals that celebrate our survival. We have festivals that celebrate our creation. We have festivals that celebrate the Torah, that celebrate divine providence, freedom, etc., etc. But, I, but it, it's, it's a little unusual to have a military festival. So the Talmud is asking, what's Hanukkah? And as Rashi understands, what's the miracle that is the real reason behind Hanukkah? So the Talmud goes on and says this. On the 25th of Kislev, that's the next month in Jewish terms. Right now, when I'm recording this, we're in Cheshvan. And the next month will be Kislev, 25th of Kislev is Hanukkah. So the 25th of Kislev is the, are the days of Hanukkah, which are eight days. Do not, we are not allowed to have eulogies during that time because a eulogy is a sad thing. It's designed to arouse people and get them to cry. Uh, so we don't eulogize during Hanukkah. Dalol is Anois Baham, we do not fast during Hanukkah. In other words, it's days of, it's a festive occasion in the sense that things that make you sad, things that are inappropriate for a festive occasion are not done during Hanukkah. And then it goes on to tell the story behind Hanukkah. It says, when the Greeks entered the, um, the sanctuary, the temple, they defiled all the oils in the temple. You see, this is very symbolic. The Greeks didn't destroy the oil. They didn't destroy the temple. What they did was they wanted to convert it into a Greek or a pagan temple. They didn't, they didn't take the oil and pour it down the drain. Right? What they did was they wanted us to use the oil, but they wanted us to use oil that was dedicated by them to idolatry, defiled oil. In other words, the Greeks were out to insinuate themselves into the Jewish people. So, so they, they, they didn't destroy the oil, they made it impure. They didn't destroy the temple, they redecorated. Also, there was another, the Talmud in a different tractate says that one of the things the Greeks did was a practice the English by the way, use this in their colonies, uh, it was called Dois de Seigneur, right, in which the, I, the, the, a woman got married right, on the first night, the, the wedding night, where she would have to spend the wedding night with the local ruler, the local Greek ruler, right? The British did this in Scotland. I think there's a movie about it. But anyway, Dois de Seigneur, they, they would have to spend the first night, which is horrific. And the idea behind that is that the Greeks wanted to insinuate themselves into the sanctity of the Jewish family as well. There is actually a tradition that one of the ways the revolt started was by one of the sisters of the Maccabees, her name was Yehudit, who was getting married. And at the wedding, she rips open her wedding dress. And the brothers say, what are you doing? What are you, where's your modesty? And she says, oh, you are worried about my modesty now? What about tonight when I have to go to the Greek ruler Holofernes? You're not worried about my modesty then? I have to sleep with Holofernes, the Greek ruler, on, the, on my wedding night. That doesn't bother you? So that, her speech inspired them to, to start the revolt. And actually, she struck the first blow in the revolt. Tradition tells us she went into Holofernes and uh, she gave him wine and cheese and stuff. You know, that was the standard, right? Wine and cheese, he gets, you know, and he drinks. She gets him drunk and she takes his sword and cuts off his head. And she walks out holding the head. Now, that was illegal in Greece at the time. And this sparked the revolt. And the brothers also, you know, the brothers basically took, the, you know, took it even further. But she was the heroine who actually started it. Actually, in commemoration of that, um, it is customary to eat dairy foods on Hanukkah. So in our family, we have fudge, right? This is not the ancient tradition, but we, my wife makes fudge. But anyway, but dairy foods, why? Because she gave him dairy foods, cheese and milk, etc., and then gave him wine together with that. And that's how she, that's how she seduced him and killed him. So anyway, uh, it says that the Greeks wanted to insinuate themselves into every area of life. And that's symbolized by the defilement, the making impure the oil. Not destroying it, making it impure. They wanted us to use it, but they wanted us to use impure oil. And it says, when the kingdom of the Hasmoneans, that's the other name for the family, the, they translate it here as the, when the Hasmonean dynasty um, uh, had victory over the Greeks, they checked and they couldn't find, all they found was one jar of oil, which still had the seal of the high priest. There was a jar of oil that was in a chamber that was, that was plastered over in a wall or a floor of the temple. And that they knew that that had not been touched by the Greeks. 
No one had lifted up and says, here's to Zeus or anything, whatever they had, right? No one did that, which means they knew for sure this had not been touched. So it was one flask of oil, right? And, and there was only, so this in itself, you could say was miraculous. They found a flask of oil. The Greeks searched the whole place to follow, but no, there was one left. By the way, commentaries say what this symbolizes, the flask of oil symbolizes that even when the Greeks were successful in assimilating so many thousands of Jews, even amongst Jews who were already assimilated, there was still a little bit of the oil of Torah, still a bit of the flask of oil, a little bit of purity left in the Jewish people, symbolized by the Hasmoneans. And even in each individual Jew who was assimilated, there's always a little flask of oil that can be rekindled. Okay. And then it says this. Uh, they found this uh, flask of oil. There was enough in it to light for one day. So they had enough. They fill up the, they build a menorah, a makeshift menorah, the Talmud tells us later. And there's enough oil in this flask to light for one day. So they pour it in, they light the menorah, and what happens is, miraculously, they're able to actually light the menorah for eight days. So this was a miracle, that the oil lasted for eight days, and that's why we light the menorah for eight days, and we light an eight-branch menorah, each one to symbolize one of the days of Hanukkah. And uh, the menorah in the temple was seven-branch candelabra. Uh, so um, the miracle was that the oil lasted eight days. The next year, the rabbis immediately made it into a yontif, a festival, Bahalel v'hoda, in praise, in praise to God and thanks to God. So Hallel is, as I said, the prayer we say in the morning, which is praising God, and it's the very joyful sections of psalms that we sing during prayers. Hoda'a means thanks to God or appreciation, and that is said in our grace after meals and also in the silent prayer, a special, special thanks for the for the miracles of Hanukkah. So, uh, interesting, that prayer is very heavily focused on the miracle of the war. So you've got the, the actual lighting of the menorah, which is the more public thing we do, that's focused on the miracle of the candles. The thing that we say during our prayers, which is more private, is focused on the miracle of the war, uh, that we won that war. And so it says they ce we celebrate it for that time for eight days. Just an interesting question, which was asked by Rabbi Yosef Karo, author of the Code of Jewish Law, a very famous question. He says, if, the, if there was enough oil to last one day, then why is the festival eight days? We should only celebrate seven days because there was only a miracle for seven days. There was no miracle first day. First day was, was, first day was not miraculous. There's enough oil for the first day. So why celebrate eight days? Just have seven days because there was only seven days of a miracle. Right? That's his question. So I would say there's probably as many answers to that question as there are Hanukkah candles lit on Hanukkah. There's an entire book with hundreds of answers to that question. I'll just give you a couple, a few. Right? Uh, one answer is that one day commemorates the victory over the Greeks, which in itself was a miracle. Seven days commemorate the miracle of the oil. Simple answer. Another answer is that there was a miracle every single day. Because if the oil didn't burn down on the first day to zero, it only burnt down one-eighth of what it would normally burn, that means there was a miracle that the quality of the oil was changed miraculously, which means there was a miracle even on the first day. And for that, we offer thanks. Third answer is, right, that the reason we have eight days, because eight symbolizes that which is beyond nature. Seven days symbolizes the seven days of creation. Eight days is one beyond nature. It symbolizes the supernatural. It symbolizes the miraculous. And therefore, eight days is very appropriate because of that, because of that idea. And there's a, a fourth answer, which is that, that, you know, even the fact that oil normally lights, that in itself we should celebrate as a miracle. We have to recognize even the correct functioning of nature is not something which is inherently assumed, right? That's also something which God directs and which God has his... You know, God sustains. So therefore, it's not enough to give thanks only for the miracle. You've got to think, give thanks also to the same degree for the non-miracle, so-called, which is the fact that there was enough oil for one day. That in itself is a miracle that the oil burns. And so therefore, we have eight days. Okay, that is what the, that is what the Talmud says. So um, according to this, the way Rashi understands it, what the Talmud seems to be saying here is that the main idea historically behind Hanukkah and what we celebrate on Hanukkah is not so much the military victory, but it's really the candles and the oil burning for eight days. Now, some say that really it's not a, that's not a contradiction because the, the fact that the candle, there was a miracle in the oil, meant that it was God's ex post facto approval of the military victory. In other words, military victories 
sometimes happen. There are small, small armies that defeat larger armies. That has happened in history. There are poorly equipped armies that have defeated very well equipped armies. That has also happened in history. There are small bands of untrained guerrillas that have beaten, right, well-trained regular soldiers. That has happened in history. How do I know? How do I know that this victory was miraculous and was divine? Maybe it can be explained in military terms. I got a book for my bar mitzvah uh, by General Sir Richard Gale called Great Battles of Biblical History. Right? He tries to explain this in naturalistic, military, strategic terms. Maybe. How do we know that that was a miracle, that war was a miracle which God had engineered and this is approved by God? Where's the stamp of approval? Right? So the answer here is, right after the war, the Maccabees go into the temple, clean it up, build a menorah, a candelabra, light it with this oil they found, and it lights miraculously for eight days. What that is doing is that's God saying, you guys were right. You guys did what you're supposed to do, and I supported it, and it was a miracle that came from me. So it really, the miracle of the, of the menorah, of the oil, is not merely a miracle in and of itself. It's there to show God's imprint and God's approval and God's agreement with the entire venture that the Maccabees did. That is basically how, how, how this is understood, and this fits in very well according to Rashi. There's another point also, which is that the only time we generally say, um, say shira, say a song to God of Hallel, is only on a miracle which goes outside the bounds of nature. So a miracle, uh, so the military victory could be a miracle. I believe that the 1948 War of Independence in Israel was a miracle. 67 War, miracle. 73 War, miracle. They're miracles. But these are not the type of things where the miracle there is much more in terms of divine providence. This happens at this moment, right? This decision is made at this time, etc., 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 right? In other words, it's God operating within the laws of nature. However, and on that, we generally don't say Hallel, which is this special prayer for a miracle. However... When something is done and it's clearly outside the laws of nature, as was the case in the oil burning for eight days, that's something which we always say Hallel, we say a special, special praise for because it's a miracle that comes outside the laws of nature. Um, okay, that's what we have time for today. I want to thank you all for uh, watching. Uh, this is Mordechai Becher. Um, Shalom TV, Dimensions of the Duff. If you'd like to hear me live or check out Gateway's seminars, we have one on December 25th in Hanover, New Jersey at a beautiful hotel. Three days of Judaism, 3,200 years of Jewish knowledge, food, and humor. Right? And uh, please check out the website for where I'm speaking, gatewaysonline.org. And um, my book, Gateway to Judaism, is now in ebook format, so you can download it from artscroll.com uh, for your iPod. Uh, or other type of reader, and uh, that's much cheaper than the hardcover. Uh, or if you want to get the regular hardcover edition, uh, you can get it at Jewish bookstores, uh, Amazon, or Barnes & Noble. Thank you for watching. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support.